Hello, everyone, and welcome to our very first Filament Games Game Art live stream. We're excited to have you with us today. I'm joined in the studio by the very talented Natasha Soglin, who in just a few minutes will be drawing something absolutely amazing that I could never even dream of drawing. So I can't draw to save my life, so we're going to le leave that up to Natasha today, and I, Kat Shanahan, will be your host this afternoon. In addition to live streaming Natasha's workspace, we're going to be fielding questions from Twitter and YouTube, so if you want to know more about game art, our art style, or fun facts about Natasha, you can tweet to us at at filament games or use the handy dandy question box in the right hand corner of the youtube channel to get started today i'm going to ask natasha to tell us a little bit about what she does here as the game art team lead at filament games hi everybody this is natasha um as the game art team lead at filament i spend a lot of my time doing a lot of concept art um, for pitches and all sorts of the projects that we work on um and just generally do doing a lot of art Thank you for explaining that because uh, we were talking to our art director, Alexander Cooney, recently on the Filament Games podcast um, about art. And I think for non-artists like myself, art is just pretty much magic. <laughs> and so um, it's nice to get a behind the scenes look at what you guys do in the studio. We have so many amazingly talented artists here. And so we're excited to bring our viewers kind of behind the scenes and look at this magical process. Uh, for those of you who are fans of Filament Games, you may remember Natasha from our blog. She's had top blog hits such as the Game Artist Arsenal which is filled with great information on which programs to use if you want to start learning um, or getting involved in game arts. And she also has one of my favorites, Game Art and Dakotas, <laughs> How Wolf Bears Have Helped My Art. <laughs> my favorite. Um, which is a great post and has a lot of good information on professional development and how to use your passion to grow your skill set. Both of these articles are available at filamentgames.com slash blog. If you head over there to the left-hand side of the page, you can click on Natasha's name and it'll bring up all of her articles. And I highly, highly encourage you to check them out um, after we're done live streaming, of course. Um, speaking of our blog, we're going to be recording today's live stream and we will post it to our blog later this afternoon. So you can watch it again. You can send it to your friends. And if you have any questions that don't get answered today or if you guys are watching the recorded version of this we encourage you to leave us a comment and we'll make sure that Natasha answers those questions so Natasha what are you going to be drawing for us today well today I thought it would be super fun to draw some of the characters that appear in one of our games called bongo balance um, and it's not not the uh, drumming type of bongos no no we're actually drawing a an animal called a bongo and it's kind of similar to an antelope um, in that it's got hooves and horns and it's pretty cool looking and then also it's got a little friend um a, t a taper friend so we're gonna draw those guys hanging out and maybe eating some of the fruit that they like to balance so much so for those of you who might not know, um, the game is not about drumming, but it's about balancing <laughs> chemical <laughs> equations. Um, so you're, you're helping two hungry animal friends balance, animal, balance their fruit so they each have enough to eat while you're also learning how to balance chemical equations. Mm -hmm. And it was one of my favorite games to work on, actually, because I took a uh, chemistry class in college and I actually ended up having to drop it because I could not balance <laughs> equations, <laughs> ironically enough. So I'm just going to start out by drawing our bongo friend, and he is got, he's got a big head right now, and he's going to have some horns that come up and go somewhere, and some big old ears, and I think these guys are going to be laying down and hanging out with their fruit. So for anybody who might not um, be familiar with our art programs, what programs are you using right now, Natasha? Right now I'm using Adobe Photoshop um, CC. That's for the Creative Cloud, that uh, a cre Creative cr Cloud suite that Adobe uses. Um, and it's basically just like your standard run-of-the-mill Photoshop program um, with really nice features um, in, in this latest version. Like uh, CC has um, 3D... Uh, aspects to it instead of just like the standard like Photoshop or photo manipulation and drawing drawing aspects. Um, so that's really nice to have like when you're working on um, 3D projects to you can pull in models and like texture them uh, in Photoshop because Photoshop has such nice brushes that it's it's look at this brush library. Oh my goodness. <laughs> they, there are so many brushes in Photoshop and you can just make your own and I've made plenty over the over the years but um it's it's just one of the best drawing programs that that i've been using because of that extensive brush library and I actually talked about some of that in my Dakota's blog a couple weeks ago 
If there's one thing I've learned uh, working here, it's that I, I, there's this whole world of Photoshop that I didn't even know existed. So I, I'm a <laughs> photographer and I use it to edit photos. And I felt like that made sense being that it was Photoshop. Um, but I mean, I, I could never do this in, in Photoshop and didn't really realize that that's kind of what you guys were using. Yeah, it's, it's really, uh, I'm not really sure how it got started as like a drawing program or or like who decided that we needed to have digital art, but I'm really grateful that they did. <laughs> Get some eyes on this guy. Hmm. Start drawing the taper too. I noticed that you are on a tablet of some sort. I am over there. What are you using? Uh, this is my what is it? It's a Wacom Intuos Pro Five. So the fifth generation of the Wacom Intuos. Um, and it's it's a medium size. It's really it's got a really nice smooth texture. It uh, will occasionally make paper sounds, um, as if you are drawing on paper, which I honestly cannot do. I just can't draw on paper to save my life. <laughs> um, but so, do you appreciate the paper sounds, or I, does that <laughs> does that drive it you? It depends. It really depends. I had a tablet for like maybe a couple of weeks. I bought a new tablet for home use, and it had the paper the paper sounds, but it also meant that it had a paper texture, and it was just kind of really gritty and mm. too difficult to draw on for me. So I had to take it back and get one of these bad boys. So I, I did say in the opening that people could um, ask fun facts about Natasha. Oh, and um, so we, we do have a request um, to please discuss corgis and ferrets. Oh, please. Oh, corgis and ferrets. I should have been drawing corgis and ferrets this whole time, I guess. So do you have any you know practical life advice out there for people who are interested in corgis and or ferrets? Um, well, I have owned ferrets for about, I want to say, six years now. And I've had a corgi for three years and my recommendation is to, you know, always, always keep a weather eye out. Be, be like Jack Sparrow and, and always watch f out for, for trouble that will and most definitely will arise, especially when you combine the two together. I feel like that's good advice. I've never owned either one. They're, they're mischievous. They're, uh, ferrets are surprisingly smart, actually. I'm not really sure where they pick that up from because when you when you look at them like just jumping around and spazzing out they're not really expressing their intelligence a whole lot until they start doing things like opening drawers or taking your wallet so you can't leave fun stuff like that i have heard that before but i've never really like met anybody who had experienced that well now you have we actually have another in-house artist Lyndon, owns two ferrets ruka and amit I had the pleasure of babysitting them not too long ago. And they were they were wonderful house guests. They didn't take my wallet. <laughs> so Natasha, are you using any like reference pictures or anything up on your screen right now or are you just doing all of this from your brilliant mind? Um I'd like to pretend that I'm doing it all from my mind, but I actually do have a couple of reference photos of some of a bongo and a taper up on my screen, which you guys can't see. So we'll just pretend that it's all coming from my mind. <laughs> and, and then we'll, we'll post the picture with the blog. So sure. if you guys want to see it, you can do that. Yeah. In reality, it's it's always helpful to have some kind of reference image up if you're going to be drawing something, um, even, even if it's not realistic. Um, like for Dakotas a lot, I'll pull up a lot of wolf references um, because they're, they're wolf-like, even though they are bear wolves of sorts. Um, but you can still pull a lot of anatomy inf anatomical information from, um, like, uh, uh, wolf stock images and, and such. So is that how you, like, get started? So when you, you know, sit down to work on a new game, how do you, how do you go about gathering that library and what do you do to get ready to start creating, you know, environments and characters for games? Um, that's a really good place to start. I usually browse on DeviantArt because it has such an extensive kind of user base and, and user made libraries of, of um, their own stock images that they've taken or that they've collected in their favorite their favorites folders. And um, just, yeah, generally searching for either the style that we want to go for in a game, um, starting out by looking up flat shapes and flat characters, or if we want to make a really colorful, whimsical game, wh uh, searching key terms that might bring some of those things up. Um, or even just the subject matter, like if we're going to make a game for a school that's set in a classroom, like what, what do different classrooms look like these days? I haven't been in a school <laughs> for a really long time. 
So what would you say is the best part about making art for educational games? Ooh, that's a good question. Just doing it is really exciting, I'd say, because I love to draw. I just love to draw. And I guess it, it is always really nice um, when we have a project for a client, when they get to see the finished product and and revel in the magic that is art, as you were saying. <laughs> <laughs> so how did you get started in game art? Um, I actually got started maybe when I was 12 years old. I started playing Neopets, and that's really how I got started in the digital art atmosphere. Um, it was a really long <laughs> process to learn um, how to move from like a, using a mouse to draw pixel art um, advancing and, and getting a tablet and investing in a tablet really it was a big purchase for, for us um, and kind of just developing these the skill set that I that I didn't have I didn't take any art classes in high school um, or call or no I did take art classes in college but not <laughs> digital art classes um, but yeah just just doing things that were fun in my spare time and and um, it's really hard to draw and talk at the same time. I forgive me. <laughs> and um, just kind of building up these personal interests where these are these there are these things that I want to draw and and I can do them somehow and looking up tutorials to figure out how to draw them in, in a certain way or how to add shading or what's the easiest way to add shading because there's tons of different ways that you can add shading. Um, yeah. Cool. So these are questions that are all coming from the people that are watching us on oh, YouTube. Cool. So if you guys are watching on Hi YouTube, guys. thank you so much. Keep sending your questions in. We will try to answer all of them. Yeah. Um, there's another one that just came up about um, what about making your own MLP characters? Oh, my own MLP characters. Okay. <laughs> well, for those of you who don't know, MLP stands for My Little Pony, which is a super adorable show uh, on, I think it's... I, don't, I can't remember the channel, but it's owned by Hasbro. Um, and I got into it based on all of the art that I was seeing on DeviantArt. I don't actually watch the show, <laughs> um, but I saw all of these really cute original characters um, on DeviantArt, and I decided that I I needed something to draw because I, had, I was going through a bit of a dry spell. I had stopped playing Neopets. Um, I didn't really have anything that was inspiring me to draw because this was before before the time of Dakotas. So I, I set out to make a character that nobody else had made. So I, I made my own little ponies. When, when was this? This was, um, I think, about last year at this time through, uh, through November was really when I was um, into it. And then suddenly November happened and then there were Dakotas in my life. So the My Little Ponies is still on? It, I That's think so. It's thing. Um, <laughs> they like re re revitalized the show. They've been through maybe four or five generations. I'm not really sure, um, but they they've started a new show like a couple of years ago. I think that that kind of brings some of the old characters back, and and they made new ones. And it's I think the reason that it's really popular is due to the amount of like really smooth animation that's going on in the show. It's like it's all either made in Toon Boom or Flash um, and Illustrator, and it's all vector art. So it's all it's it's just really smooth and like really appealing to look at, and really easy to draw. <laughs> Apparently, it's season six of season My six. Little Pony. Okay, good for them. I think I skipped a question, so I'm I'm scrolling. No worries. I'm gonna start drawing this tape right now. I think I'm I'm getting a little too sketchy on my secondary sketch lines. I'm gonna try to refine these a little bit. I might need to change my brush for this. My brush library. Okay, so YouTube question. Do you have any favorite mediums aside from digital illustration programs? Ooh. I don't want to say no because I don't want to not give an answer, but no because <laughs> I can't. I just I'm really not a very strong traditional artist. Um, paper and pencil is quite difficult for me. <laughs> um, I tend to draw 
things slanted to the right, which is why digital media is so useful because I can do things like this and switch stuff around and I can see where um, where in my images things have get it gotten skewed and, and kind of fix them as they go. And I'm going to fix this real quick. There. So it's a, it's not too bad actually in this image, but I'm I'm prone to um, like skewing my art and skewing is like um, when you are stretching, if you stretch a square, um, if you drag just one corner to make that one corner larger than the other corners, that's what skewing is. Um, and I just do that naturally out of habit. Um, I've been trying to train myself out of it, but it's it's not been successful so far. <laughs> <laughs> so it looks like you, you did like a preliminary sketch and now you're going back over it. Is that safe to assume? Yep. Um, I'm going. I'm doing the uh, kind of more refined line art or stroke, as as we sometimes call it. Um, giving it just like a really clean, hard edge. Um, figuring out where all those little details are going to go to make these characters look nice and friendly. And giving it kind of more, giving it a more refined style in this stage. This taper is not very taper-like, but that's okay. We can move his head down so that he come becomes more taper-like. If my keyboard will let go of this. Oopsie. There we go. Yeah, and then I'll, after um, the line art is done, I can go in and fill in all the colors and make them really pop. Have you have you played Bongo Balance recently, Kat? Um, I played it right when we launched it. Okay, that was a while ago. It, I think we launched it in February. Um... Yeah, I think that was the last time that I played it. Huh. There are some games that I'll play like frequently, like The Counting Kingdom is a really adorable game. Mm -hmm. Like Crazy Plant Shop is super cute. I love Crazy Plant um, Shop. So the, the chemistry was not my thing, you know. I think Me either. <laughs> I had I a just, couple people say that. Yeah, it's it was too hard. So yeah, I was um, I was happy to make it through Bongo Balance and uh, have not revisited it since. <laughs> well, excellent. I'm glad you were able to get at least one playthrough then. And, and my chemistry skills did improve, I will say yes, that. Yes, yes, I, I swear it is, it is helpful. Mm. Have you worked on any of our other internal games? Ooh, I have. I've been, I actually worked on Crazy Plant Shop for a little bit. Um, I think I was hired at like the tail end of that and then I got to touch touch it a little bit when we did like a revitalization of it or we kind of remade it a little. Okay. Um, yeah, I did some of the animations, um, added some of the new characters, and I actually did voiceover for three of the characters. In Crazy Plant Shop? I yes. Wow. I think one of their one of the characters' name is Andressa and that's the only one I can remember. She was really mean and an <laughs> unpleasant person. It was really fun to do. That's always interesting when I, so when typically when employees are hired, they go through and they play, you know, the games to get used to them and things like that. And I never really thought about all of the voice talent coming from within the studio. Oh, yeah. And so it's interesting to be playing this game and, you know, you just had a conversation with somebody who is now in the, uh, in the, in the game, which is kind of cool. Mm-hmm. Dan, Dan Norton does a lot of voices, our um, chief creative officer. And Cooney does as well, our art director. He, Cooney's amazing at, at voice acting. He is. If you have not checked him out on our newest episode of the Film and Games podcast, you really have to. Um, about once a season, I cry. I laugh so hard I cry in the studio, <laughs> and it, it totally happened. And I think it kind of overwhelmed him because it was his first time oh, no. on the podcast. But oh my goodness, he's so good. Mm hmm. Mm hmm. He does, um, what's that, the, the cell command, um, I think he's like the chief or the lieutenant or something, which is just amazing. I have to go back and play that. I actually, I like cell command quite a bit. It's, uh, that one's a fun one too. Science, who knew? Right? Science can be fun. <laughs> Our next jingle will be brought to you by Natasha. <laughs> So, Natasha, we have more questions uh -huh. um, from YouTube. So, as an artist, do you get to come up with a lot of the characters, or is that more of a game designer's role? Um, it depends. Usually the idea or, like, the existence of a character will come from the designer. But in terms of actual character design, like what they look like, um, how they move, what they're wearing, their color palette will all come from our internal game, game art team. So once... So once you kind of have that and, and it's handed off to you, mm -hmm. what's, because I've heard you talk a little bit about some animation that you've done. 
how what does your like daily work look like besides just sketching and drawing and you know breathing life into these characters um well aside from just drawing i do a lot of animation in um adobe animate which is what used what used to be flash (laughs) um they they upgraded a little bit um and they they've got like a pretty simple timeline timeline tool that allows for like really simple walk cycle animations or puppeting animations. And I've actually also um, kind of recently gone into the games themselves, into the game engine like Unity and done animation in there, um, kind of setting up how, like if there's a transition, I might uh, figure out how the transition's gonna play out. Um, Sometimes characters are animated within Unity itself. Um, And just generally um, trying to make life as easy as possible for our interaction design artists. (laughs) (laughs) So what's the difference between an interaction design artist and what you do? An interaction design artist uh, makes the things as they appear both on on the screen as you're playing it and like kind of in the back ends where they... It, they they hook everything up, they make it run, they make it smooth, they make it pretty. And it's all I've actually recently recently been doing some UX work on a on a project um that we're kind of updating for iPad and it's so much work. I can't even believe it. Just updating assets, kind of clearing out um the asset library and making sure that everything is the correct format. It's it's a lot of work. It's a lot of grunt work, but it's also really satisfying when you're able to like make a f- uh, a fix for a bug or something, and it but maybe the programmer can't quite figure out that happened to me yesterday. And that was an, an amazing feeling. <laughs> <laughs> I was so proud of myself. Um, interaction design artists also make a lot of the interface, as as their um, titles kind of suggest. They make buttons and um, the the overall interface for the game itself in case there's like a layout that buttons need to sit on. Um, What else do they do? They're generally in charge of asset lists, but we are recently um, empowering our game artists to kind of take over that ownership of the asset lists themselves. Okay. Taking taking a little bit off the plate of the game, of the interaction designer because (laughs) their job is so extensive. We do have more YouTube questions. Keep them coming, you guys. These are really, really great questions. Um, I'm a little bit afraid of the answer to this next question. Uh, okay. Um, but uh, potentially a relative of yours. Do you know a Rachel? Oh, is that? Yes. I, I do have a, a Rachel in my family. Uh-oh. Is my sister watching? I can't see. She would like to know how many hours you draw every day <laughs> on average. How many hours I draw every day. Um, whenever I'm not sleeping, I am drawing. I was afraid of that. Yeah. <laughs> and, um, recently I've been going to bed at maybe one thirty in the morning. Oh my gosh. Yeah. So I, basically my day is I go to work and I draw and then I come home at like six or so and I just keep drawing. And you talked a little bit about that in your Dakota's post, too. Yes. About how that, you know, helps you at work and helps you, you know, grow your design skills, too, which I thought was really interesting. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Time, t- I'm still working on the time management aspect of it. <laughs> <laughs> so if somebody wanted to see where you do all of this personal work after you leave, do you have some place that people can go? I do. I have um, a DeviantArt account, and the username is German, and it's a little hard, difficult to pronounce and spell, but I think we can type that out for you guys. It's actually um, locktaub.deviantart.com. I'm, I'm going to need you to spell I, that. I, can, I think I have the power to type that in here. Maybe not. Um, nope, I don't. It's L-A-C-H-T-A-U-B-E.deviantart.com. Yeah, Megan's got it. <laughs> oh, great. I was just typing it. Thank you, Megan. <laughs> I appreciate that. A couple more questions from YouTube. Um, let's see. I got to scroll. We have so many questions I have to scroll. This oh, is wonderful. Good. Do you typically draw characters or also landscaping and environments? I draw it all. We don't have any particular um, like division for what our game artists can do. Uh, some of us do have specialties. Roma is an amazing architectural artist. Um, Chenya draws cute things. 
ro- uh, Linden is really good at, at robots and like really precise 3D things because she's also a 3D artist. Um, and my specialty is kind of in animals, as you can see. <laughs> so how big is our art team? Our art team consists of three people, not including myself. So I guess overall four. Okay. Four of us, yeah. Do you listen to music when you draw? I do. I have my own playlist that I listen to every single day, and I think I've listened to the same playlist for maybe six months now. It's a little embarrassing. But I'll, I'll frequently play that um, when I'm live streaming um, my personal art at home. Can we send out a link to that after? Is that okay Ooh, with you? Sure. So if you are uh, if you're if you're watching this after the fact, we're gonna have that in the blog. So it should be you know to the left, right, or below the the video. But we will put that on the blog afterward if you want to see. We'll put a link to Natasha's profile. Um, we'll also put um, the art that she's working on now, the video, and um, her um, deviant art as well, along with the playlist. So mm-hmm. be sure to check that out. It's mostly Dakotas. Spoiler alert. Your profile? Uh, everything. <laughs> what Can you give us like a little preview? I mean, you don't have to sing or anything, but can you give us oh, a little no. preview of what's on this playlist? Um, let's see. We've got, I've got some pentatonics on there. The oh, acapella nice. Group. Yeah. Um, what else is on there? Some, I want to say Kelly Clarkson probably because she's the bomb. Mm-hmm. I used to have T-Swift on there because she is like my soulmate musically. Um, but I... I'm not sure why I took her songs off of there. I love that you have pentatonics on there. Oh, yeah. We were just doing um, the recording of the retro review <gasps> in the studio this week, and we were um, playing Carmen Sandiego. Oh. And the Carmen Sandiego, like, the jam from the game show by mm-hmm. Rockapella. Oh, I love it. Wow. I get it stuck in my head all week, and I'm just, like, bopping around with this <laughs> acapella song stuck in my head. That's good stuff. Um, and I make up the words because I don't know them. Mm-hmm. <laughs> like, like you do. Right. All right, Cody Jones on YouTube has asked, if one would want to draw, if one would want you to draw something for them, do you accept requests? Um, I don't typically accept requests because if I if if I had the time to do that, that's all I would do in my spare time. And I, I so wish that I could, but my um, form of requests, as it were, is usually actually as commissions, So I, which are currently uh, closed right now because I've been working on some personal art as of late. But I do have um, like a price sheet um, for my personal art somewhere on my DeviantArt that is available to look at um, in case I do open those back up again. But it's it's been a while. I haven't, I haven't done commissions in maybe six months or so since I started playing Dakotas. Oops. Okay, we have a, we have a three part question. Okay. Are you ready for this? A three um, part question m- from Al Jacobson. One at a time. Al, come on. <laughs> All right, I'll read. I'll read them one one at a time. Right. I'm not doing anything difficult over here. I mean, you're drawing and talking and it's you know not, doing all sorts of things. It's not easy. <laughs> it, it doesn't look easy. <laughs> um, okay, so part number one okay. is it pretty typical through the game art process um, in the development phase? Uh, sorry, I'm getting more notifications, um, <laughs> that there's a number of versions, particularly in working with clients. There are, it depends on what the phase is. So we start out we're making our games with a design discovery phase. Um, usually there is concept art that is pitched during that time. Um, and that's usually just kind of what we can come up with off the top of our head based off of the um, design document. So if there's characters, but it doesn't really specify what the character looks like, then we'll just come up with whatever we can and and hope that it fits the feel of the game the best. Um, and then after that, um, after we have our initial concepts kind of looked at, they might have, or the client might have some suggestions or some requests to change some of those initial concepts, in which case we will draw up another set of concepts and send it to them for approval before we start uh, diving into actual game art assets. Okay, so how does that, how in that context, how does the work change over time? Um, it could change, it could change based on the design of the game, maybe something about the game changed. Um, like, instead of having four characters, there is now uh, a, like a, a customizable avatar that you can make, so that could change the the number of assets that we uh, need to make for the game, or the overall style could change. It's really kind of up in the air depending on what the client is is looking for. 
Now we, we're adding color now. I we see. Are. Well, I mean, we have been for a couple minutes, but yes. we had a lot of great questions. Yes. So that was that was high priority. But can you tell us a little bit about kind of the color and how you pick the color and how yeah. you're applying it? Um, my typical watchers will know, hopefully by now, that I usually pick a random color, something that's easy to see. Um, this one just actually happens to be the color of a bongo. Um, but yeah, I, I, I'll just pick a random color and just fill in, color in the lines as it were, like you do um, when coloring lines. Sometimes I'll miss. And um, just kind of get a solid layer, like a base layer in there. Then, and then um, I'll work on top of that kind of using a masked layer, which kind of enables enables me to draw wherever without it showing up anywhere except for on top of like the base layer. And then add details like um, maybe different patterns in the fur or shading goes on on top of there as well. Um, but for now I'm just gonna I'm just gonna layer down a solid color and and then look at what we need to change from there. Zoomed in pretty far. It's kind of hard to see the overall image, which is actually why it's really nice to have this navigator up in the right-hand corner so I can keep glancing at that from time to time to see how the overall image is looking as, as a thumbnail version. So I think one thing to clarify, and, and everybody probably assumes this, but this is all real time. So if uh, watching this come together and, you know, when you were sketching and then adding the stroke and things on top of that, I was just amazed at how fast you could do it. That is one of the things that I am known for here, actually, is um, I, I, I draw very quickly. I don't take time to really um, focus on on things other than the thing that needs to happen right now. So uh, occasionally that comes back to bite me, but for the most part, I can take a step back every once in a while and look at the overall picture and say, okay, is this working? No, let's change that. Or okay, is it working now? Then yes, let's move on to the next thing. And I've been I've been doing this since I was 12 again. <laughs> so wow, yeah, it's 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 been a while. Um, lots of lots of practice. So what is your favorite thing about working at Filament? Ooh, hmm. I would like to say that it is the opportunity. It is, it's an opportunity for me to just sit down and draw all day, but I would be doing that anyway in my spare time. Um, so I, I will answer that with a the people. It is the people here that I love to come and see and hang out with and talk to every day, and we get to make really amazing things together. And there are so many incredibly talented people here that it's just like a real treat to be able to make something with them. I would definitely agree with that. Mm -hmm. And whenever we ask that on the podcast, you that's usually, that's usually what people say. Yeah. And that earned four purple hearts from Elle Jacobson. Yay. Thanks, Elle. Elle is one of those people that I get to work with. So again, if you guys have questions on Twitter, you can tweet us at Filament Games or use the chat in the right-hand um, corner of the um, YouTube page. We're answering questions there. And we have another one. How hard is it to draw on a tablet? Uh, how, hold on. <laughs> oh, how hard is it to draw on a tablet but look at your monitor? Ooh, that's that's a really good question. Some people prefer drawing directly on a screen um, using something like the Wacom Cintiq, which, is, which we have a couple of in our studio, actually. But I, I tried using the Wacom, or the, the Cintiq, and I just couldn't do it because I need to be able to see where my cursor is and where the lines are appearing and I can't do that if I'm if I have to look through my hand so I actually um, I I developed um, use of the tablet um, early on in my years uh, and it took maybe six months to really get used to it it, it took a really long time. I actually, I think it was a, a Christmas gift for my parents, my first tablet. And I was so upset the first time that I used it because everything was just totally wobbly and not smooth and not consistent. And I was so upset that I just was not going to be able to use it because it, was, it, was, it wasn't working. But really what I needed to do was, and what I ended up doing was um, I used it as a mouse. And I, I, I get comments on that a lot, but I, I do use my, my tablet as a, as a mouse from time to time, either to play games or to just surf around on the internet. Um, 
do different different things. We have a really great question um, from somebody actually who I think found us on extra credits and um, had inquired about our case study, which we sent out today. So they've sent in a really great question um, saying, how are things interdepartment? For example, if an artist comes up with a game idea, can you pitch it to the designers? Has it ever happened before or does everyone usually focus on their department? That is an excellent question. And actually, we do have we we encourage everyone as much as possible to speak up when they have an idea. So if if. If I have a game idea and, and I have, um, I'll, I'll talk to somebody who I think might be interested. And it doesn't have to be a designer. It doesn't have to be the CEO. It can just be anybody who wants to sit down and kind of jam on a game for a little bit and then see where that goes. And if it looks like it might be able to take off, then maybe the, take that to our uh, CCO, Dan Norton, and see what he thinks of it and and really take off with it. I think that's another really great characteristic of our office, too. I remember Mm -hmm. within my first month, um, I was sitting at the computer working on some things, and a couple of the designers came over and said, hey, can we borrow you for a minute? And I was like, um, sure. (laughs) Like, well, we really want you to play this thing because we really want you to see how you do this or how you do this and Mm -hmm. kind of walk through things. Um, And it was interesting that, you know, there are those connections where people can just come up to you and say, hey, I want to borrow your brain to work on this. And there's that, you know, collaboration in there, too, which I think is really, really good um, for the projects, but also makes our studio really different. Mm-hmm. Yeah, everyone has their own specialties and expertise, but everyone also has an opinion and and is able to do things that is outside of their job description. So you're adding all sorts of funky colors yes. right now. So what's going on? So the um, the animals in Bongo Balance are actually not realistically colored. They're kind of riffs off of real colors. So a a bongo is usually like a reddish brown with black and um, yellow stripes. The taper is kind of a like a grayish brown, but we've skewed that in the um, in the game to make them really pop and be really acidic and loud. And so the bongo kind of turned into this pinkish color and the taper is actually a blue and yellow. And that's just how they ended up. Because that's what was more fun. (laughs) (laughs) I'm going to send out a link in the chat right now for Bongo Balance. So people can go take a look at that. Yeah. Oh, I actually, I can't. Uh, That's uh that's interesting. YouTube says, oops, I have to remove the web address. Okay. Well, if you go to (laughs) filamentlearning.com, you can see Bongo Balance um, and take a look at the artwork on that. It's an awesome game. It'll be the blue taper. Let's see. This is getting a little bit messy in here, but that's okay. I think he's got some yellow around the eye. I'm actually not looking at it right now, the original artwork. I, sh- I probably should. <laughs> but I think I remember it well enough. I drew it. <laughs> and we're not going to judge you if it doesn't, you know, exactly match. <laughs> it's only been, like, three years. <laughs> is shading hard? Shading is so much fun, but so time consuming. I actually could get to that right now, so I can show you live. Let's see, I'm gonna make a new layer. And what I do is I use um, Photoshop's kind of uh, different layer types. So I'll take um, like a, just a regular layer, a masked layer, and I will color it white as I'm doing right now. And then what I might do is take what I think would be a good shadow color, which is usually um, like a purple or a blue if the sun is shining down. The the yellow sun makes makes purple lighting or p- purple shading, and just kind of block in where the shadows might fall. So if I've got the sun is beating down this way, shadows are gonna f- uh, fall off where the where the light doesn't doesn't hit. And it's, um, you can just kind of really messily block stuff in. It doesn't have to be super detailed f- from the back. So we, I, I'll, I'll go back in afterwards and kind of fix things up and clean it up and make it look nice. But for the most part, it's like, yeah, this is, this, this makes sense. And then you go into your um, layer effects and change that to multiply. And there you have a shaded bongo right there. So then I'll usually go back and forth between normal mode and multiply mode and kind of refine the shading in there and kind of give them some gradients, which is where the color falls off a little bit from the purple to the white and kind of build in more details as I go along. 
Megan has left us a note that you're really cool oh. and you're amazing. And so I just wanted to relay that because you're working very hard over there. Thank you, Megan. Thank you, Kat. It's always nice to know that people people like, like the stuff that I do. I don't know how many um, people from DeviantArt we have in here, or, f or from Dakotas in particular. But it'll be fun to, lo to look at the chat once, once everything's did and done to see, to see who dropped by. Yes, and if you guys missed the beginning, we are going to post this recording on our blog with some additional resources and different things um, from Natasha. Her her music that she listens to, her playlist when she's drawing, <laughs> we'll also have the artwork that she's working on and some links to some resources and different things. So um, again, if you're watching now, just remember that that'll be on the blog. And then if you're watching the recording, you can go down in the comment section. If there's any other questions that you want to ask Natasha, you can leave them there and we'll make sure they get answered. Yeah. I'm gonna start shading the taper too, because it's always it's always a good idea in in my personal opinion to start um, kind of doing things all at the same time instead of maybe fully rendering out one character and then not really being sure about what level of fidelity you're gonna reach until it's done and then you kind of look at the blank character next to them and think okay well I have to do that all over again so it's nice to just kind of build stuff in layers as you're going along to do the same thing at, at the same time for different characters. We have some more great questions. Um, what do you do when you get frustrated? If you do, we're not saying that you do, <laughs> we're just saying in the event that you were to potentially get frustrated, what would you do I when you're never, working on a piece? Never get frustrated. No, that's not true. I get frustrated all the time. I just keep working on it until either I feel like I can't work on it anymore, in which case I will save it instead of scrapping it. Um, and then I'll just start working on something else. Or maybe if I'm just too worked up, I can't draw anymore, it's too much, I'll go do something else like go for a poke walk or take Monty with me, my, my corgi Monty. So you said that you don't, that if you get frustrated, you don't delete something. Is I that kind of common practice? Do you save everything? I'm not really sure what is common practice, but I like to save everything. I'm a little bit of a hoarder with my computer files, um, just because you never know what you're going to need or what you might look back at um, later on. Um, and a lot of the times I've been finding myself recently um, not finishing art for a while, and then I'll come back to it maybe weeks or months later even, and I'll say, okay, I can see where I was going with this, but this is all wrong. I'm going to fix it in the way that I now know how to fix it that I didn't know how back then. That's kind of cool that you can go back and revisit those projects mm -hmm. and get a little bit of a different flavor on them. and Because mm -hmm. it's, it's not quite as much fun going into a piece that you've already quote-unquote finished <laughs> <laughs> and changing stuff about that as much as you might want to. Once I think once a, once a picture is finished, then it's definitely finished. We, we have a pretty heavy compliment here from Campbell Hopkins. Ooh. He says, you're the best drawer I have ever seen, and oh, you're wow. better than Picasso and Van Gogh. That's, that's some heavy stuff, man. I don't know about that, but I appreciate the compliment. I wonder what it would be like. Are there like art contests where you like throw down against other artists, and what does that look like? Um, there actually are. Every now and then, DeviantArt will host a contest. Um, either like the DeviantArt admin team themselves or occasionally um, different users will host contests. A lot of um, Dakota's contests actually rely on like a, at least a marginal, 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 the word is marginal, amount of art <laughs> skill. Um, but a, a lot of the times for Dakota's in particular, the skill level or like the, 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 the like, grading is based on your personal effort rather than like overall skill level, level compared to somebody else. So like if somebody who's just starting out um, draws one Dakota and then let's say I'll draw another Dakota and I've been doing this for 12 years, so I've got 12 years of experience on them, then it, it, would, it wouldn't be particularly fair in, in the admins team if if I just automatically win because I've it's it's automatically better but they take they take that information and then look at the content of your gallery and kind of compare and contrast where your efforts lie um, based on your your previous works okay yeah so have you ever drawn or participated in paint chats I don't think I know what that is I don't I don't think so I'm I gonna do say either. no <laughs> there 
Uh, let me see. There is another question. Okay. If you could choose any game in the history of games, going as far back as games have ever been created, um, and help and go back in time and help make art for it, what game would it be? Oh, man. Um, that's a really good question. We have some tough questions. Yeah. Wow. They're all very, very good questions, though. Well, I guess... Hmm. I don't want to spend too much time thinking about it, but I would say either... Telltale's The Walking Dead season two because they have like a little bit of a leg up on technology from season one, the se- third season, season one game, or Oregon Trail. And I think you guys um, played that in your podcast not not too long ago, but I was I was re- recently watching it actually, and I just thought it was so much fun to see like how the pixel art kind of interacted with each other like like especially during the hunting game like yeah where did they come up with that at the time or what were their inspirations because there wasn't a whole lot of games like that were standard back then and i'd like to I would, it would be nice to be on a team where like that much innovation is happening but it looks like we're going to <laughs> <laughs> that's very true yeah. so to piggyback off that uh, is there a game that you think was crippled by its art or could have been a better game or a greater game if it had better art? Ooh. Hmm. I can't think of any off the top of my head, but I can turn that question around and say that sometimes games spend way too much time, effort, and money on art. You don't need the most amazing looking graphics in the world to have a good game. So if they sometimes if they had taken time um, out of their art, art budget and spent it elsewhere, like in the game design, then they would have an infinitely better game. Like um, I heard there was some critique of uh, Firewatch, which I have not yet played, but Firewatch has amazing, amazing art and graphics. But um, the story I heard was was not as satisfying as some people would have liked it to be for for how good it looked. So there was a little bit of a letdown there, I guess. I'll have to I'll have to play it for myself and and see. Is there, we were kind of talking to um, our art director, Alexander Cooney, about this when he was on the podcast, but are there any games that are coming out that you're really excited about the art style or um, an art st- a game art style in general that you're excited about? Ooh, um, I think there's a game, someone might have to correct me if I'm wrong, but I think there's a game called No Man's Sky that is either coming out or has already come out. <laughs> yes. So they just, I think they just reached gold because okay. we were talking about it on the podcast and Cooney said the same thing. I Yeah, I'm really excited for that one. <laughs> it looks it looks beautiful. Every time we mm-hmm. link to it on the blog um, for the podcast, I always think, wow, that is a really, really gorgeous game. Yeah, that's they've done some incredible things. I haven't I haven't looked into it too much. I just know from like browsing the internet and seeing it and saying, "Oh, wow, that's really cool looking. Maybe I'll play that." And I don't I don't get too excited about games unless it's like Pokemon Go usually, <laughs> <laughs> which the entire studio is very very excited about, including yourself now. I I hear you recently downloaded it. I did. I did. So we will, we'll see how it goes. I was, <laughs> I was a little bit nervous. I was driving. Well, I, I wasn't driving, but I was in the car and I was, you know, going to my hometown, which is about, you know, 45 minutes away. And I'm all excited to like have somebody else drive so I can look for Pokemon. Mm-hmm. And there was nothing on the map, oh. like literally nothing. And I'm thinking, I live in a town of about 15,000 people and there's not even a, a map here. <laughs> so I got a little bit nervous, but, um, you know, I reset and, and there is in fact, um, playable space and there are awesome. Pokestops and I That's have, good. you know, caught a couple. So Excellent. I do hear sometimes um, people will post their their Pokemon successes and I guess if you live in like the southwestern United States in the middle of nowhere, you can get some Doduos, which are desert dwelling Pokemon, I guess. Ooh. And, but that's that's it. That's all I got. <laughs> <laughs> so we're, we're all very eagerly awaiting for the uh, trading trading features to be released ah yes so can you give us a status update on what you're working on right now uh right now i am just kind of refining the shading on this bongo giving it a little bit of details in the face um because the face is where you're going to be looking at and focusing on the most so i'm gonna kind of smooth out these areas down here and then i'll probably end up zooming in on these faces to to give them a lot of detail to boost up the contrast and and 
make them look really sharp and slick. Elle has another great question. Do artists ever work together to draw game art on the same piece? And if so, can that be challenging? Ooh, that has happened in the past. Um, it is challenging because you've got two different artists with two unique styles. And try as we may to match those styles, it doesn't always work out. Um, so a lot of the times if we do work on the same art asset, we'll need to establish a workflow. Um, a lot of the times in the past, I would begin sketches and kind of lay down the basic colors and the basic shapes, and then Chenya might pick it up and finish it off. And we would have to do that for all of our, for all of our images to get that kind of level of Chenya finish on, on our assets. So one of the things that I was thinking about, um, can you elaborate a little bit on the differences kind of between creating game art and other forms of art? Sure. So game art, um, game art has a specific purpose when you are making it. Either it's going to sit in the background and look nice, or it might move around on the screen. The player might control it, maybe not. So all of these things are, are things that you need to take into consideration, both um, aesthetically and kind of technically, like how is it going, to, how are you going to build it? How is it going to interact with all the other um, pieces, parts of the game? Who's going to be implementing it? How do you need to like rearrange it on the canvas to, to make it fit with everything else? So it's, it takes um, a lot of consideration. I don't want to say any more or any less than any other forms of art. I personally don't put a whole lot of thought into my personal art. Um, other than uh, like emotions and the reaction that that a, a viewer might have when looking at it, um, but yeah, it's it's different for sure. And when you're working with a client on the art and they've got opinions on what it should look like and you've got opinions on what it should look like, how do you manage that relationship and how do you kind of work with them to help them understand your point of view and how your art matches the in-game style? Uh, that's, that's tricky and that's actually something that comes up quite a bit. Um, a client might come in with an idea of some of a game or game art style that they have in mind and maybe that doesn't quite fit super well with with my personal um, tastes or with my abilities. And so we either I'll, I'll ramp up and, and get to that level <laughs> or, or we might um, kind of talk them back from this like beautiful 3D rendered world Call of Duty image that they have in their mind and, and, and let them know, well, that's maybe not super feasible. So we're gonna try to pinpoint what is it that they really want to go for. Art is super difficult to talk about and pinpoint exactly what it is about a, a, a piece that that makes you like it or not like it. Um, so we kind of do a lot of talking in terms of figuring out what about the art is working and what isn't and why do we want these things or why is it, why does it need to be different technically? There may be technical constraints that, that prevent some styles from, from leaking, leaking through. That's good information. I know that when I, um, you know, in a previous life, um, <laughs> when I would work with artists, that was always something that was kind of new to them too, is going from kind of creating their own art into creating something for a client mm -hmm. and for a purpose. And yep. so I think that was really good advice for anybody who's transitioning out of college or high school and trying to work with more clients and build those relationships. Mm -hmm. So now that we've been grilling you for almost an hour, um, we have a question. Is it hard to draw and talk at the same time? But I want to know how hard is it? Oh, my gosh. <laughs> um, let's see. Driving is dangerous, so I won't compare it to driving. But um, <laughs> let's say you are walking through an airport and you need to catch your plane in the next 10 minutes. And it's exactly 10 minutes away, so you need to walk very quickly. But at the same time, Mewtwo has come up on your Pokemon Go and you need to catch me too. <laughs> Do those things at the same time. <laughs> it's a little bit like that. Okay. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, so we were just talking about different art styles, right? And we've mm -hmm. got um, a couple different art styles that we do in the office. Um, can you, I know that you don't work directly with 3D, but can you talk a little bit about 3D art in our office? Sure. I do some 3D. I'm not very good at it. I don't have any professional training on 3D, but I've learned a thing or two from both Cooney and Lyndon. Um, 
as, as far as 3D art goes in our office, um, we use the free um, 3D program called Blender. Um, and I want to emphasis put emphasis on free. So anybody can download it and use it. Um, it's great for modeling, for sculpting, um, for texturing. You can break apart the, um, the model into a UV map and, and texture it either directly in Blender or take it into Photoshop or Paint Tool Sci and do it there. Um, and those are all programs that you mentioned in your Game Artist's yeah, Arsenal post yes. as well that mm-hmm. kind of talks about, especially for, like we were saying a minute ago, students that are coming out of college or people looking to get into game art. That's a great post that shares some of those tools. Very thrifty. So if somebody is, you know, coming out of, of college um, and looking for a job, mm-hmm. um, we do have a question that says, what does Filament look for in a person's art and style when hiring an illustrator? We are a very whimsical studio, so we look for a certain amount of, of whimsy, um, kind of playfulness. Um, since we do make games for uh, schools um, and we want to make games that appeal to kids, um, something that's more timely. Um, so kind of emulating styles that are more popular these days, like Steven Universe or um, I don't know how much Adventure Time style is fading, phasing out right now, but kind of keeping up with the times and, and and just like, you know, checking for pop culture references. <laughs> um, and something that is a huge influence f- um, for when we are hiring um, is we will take a look and see how much um, like personal art does a person make in their spare time? How much time do they de- dedicate to their craft? Okay, so you're looking for what they can produce, but then also just kind of their general feel for art and what they like to do. Yeah, just kind of a general mindset so we can kind of get a, get a glimpse into the minds of, of our applicants. Okay. So I have, we have kind of an exciting question from um, Super Evil Monkeys, um, which I'm actually dying to know the answer to this because I've been in here with you the entire hour and I've heard you using key combinations and shortcuts and all sorts of different things that I obviously have no <laughs> idea what they're doing. Um, so the question is, do you have any shortcuts um, key combinations, tablet keys that you use often, and if so, what are your favorite? Control Z all the way forever. <laughs> That's my life. Contro- that one I do know. I do know that one. <laughs> that one I got. For those who don't, Control Z is undo. Um, in Photoshop, it is. Um, if you go back and forth between Control Z, it will make things disappear and reappear. So if you want to go back into your history further, you need to hold down Control Shift Z. Nope, just kidding. It's what is it? It's Alt Control Alt C. Yeah, and you can go back and forth. And back that's on a, that's on a PC, need. right? Yes. Um, for Apple, it would be Apple Z. Yes, we're gonna go with that. It's been a while since I used an Apple computer. Um, but ap- apart from Control Z, I guess um, being able to access my brush library is really important. So I've actually. Um, kind of given a hot click to my tablet pen, my lower tablet pen button, so I can just access that whenever I need to. Um, space bar is to grab and drag so I can move around the canvas with ease, and then it kind of just woo, keeps floating. And those are, those are really it. I don't use any of the buttons on this tablet. Um, I, you can map them. There's eight buttons in total with like a, a ring in the center. It's like a circle where you can like wheel in and out, and I don't know what any of them do right now, and I've never used them, but I'm sure they're useful for some people. So can you, um, Elle asked, was it a crazy feeling the first time you saw kids playing a, a game with art that you drew, and did they comment on it, and what was that experience like? Oh man, I don't even remember what the first game was <laughs> that I made art for that people played. Um, it might have been Reach for the Sun, I guess. Um, and it was just real. It was really amazing to see these kids play this game on iPad, and they were just so enthralled by it. But you know, that's a combination of game design and and all sorts of other factors. That's it's not just the art. It's not just the art that's the main focus of the game. You don't play a game to look at the art. You play a game to to experience the game. But it was it was still amazing, and I'm still amazed anytime I see like my art anywhere. (laughs) (laughs) I think, I mean, I'm amazed anytime I see your art anywhere, but for a very different reason. (laughs) Well, thank you. (laughs) 
We have another question about um, when you're off the clock and working on personal arts. Um, do you, what sort of um, type or style of art do you create and do you dabble in other forms of art? Ooh, I really like to go for kind of a Disney-esque style where it's, um, it's actually kind of similar to this where I've drawn these like big-eyed uh, characters with kind of a black stroke, kind of similar to maybe like the Lion King is a good one. That's, that's always a good reference. Um, and that's really it. I'm not super adept at drawing without lines. I need at least, at the very least, a sketch to start out with. Um, and usually the sketch kind of just lends itself to needing to be filled in with like a really defined stroke. So. I, I could do lineless art, but I choose not to. And do you do any other forms? Do you do any sculpture or crafting? Oh, or? nope. I can't do those things. <laughs> <laughs> not my strongest suit. I did take a couple of 3D classes in college. Um, they were not my favorite. I have a really hard time thinking in a 3D space. Um, which actually has gotten better now that I've been working on some 3D games here at Filament. Um, but it's 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 tricky to to be able to like touch a real thing and make it move in a certain way. Although the most recent thing that I made in 3D was a uh, sculpy toilet. That was fun to make. I made a, a toilet sculpture. Can can you elaborate a little bit well, on I that? I don't know if we can share share the the secrets of the toilet, but um, it has a purpose. It's a keychain right now. We we plan on sending those out or sending that out to to some YouTubers who have requested keychains for their keychain arsenal. How how does I, I guess I'm kind of curious. How does one go about starting to make a toilet keychain? It was so hard. I can't even tell you. I sat there touching the clay for about 30 minutes without actually producing anything. Um, so you actually, you, you physically sculpted this? Yes. Okay. It's, it's, it was fun. I actually have it on my desk right here. Oh, I see um, that. You, maybe we can take a picture of that. Um, I, I started out with some tinfoil, the last of the tinfoil that we had in the office. Sorry, everybody. Um, and I made a bowl shape because I, I knew that the toilet had a bowl. And I just kind of went from there and built up different layers and until it started looking like a toilet. Oh, it, it looks very nice. Oh, thank you. It's my golden toilet. <laughs> it, it does, yes, have that color. It's very well sculpted, <laughs> a very nice 3D piece. Thank you. <laughs> but yeah, that's, that's about all I can do is make toilets. So I do have to ask because now both Elle and I want to know and so does uh, Mo Cheeks. Uh, what is your favorite Pokemon? Oh, oh. Bulbasaur. I know it's like asking you to choose between your children. I, but it is. It is. It's a. It's a very, very close tie between Clefable and Bulbasaur. But Bulbasaur takes the cake every time because Bulbasaur is number one. And I, I'm not just saying that. It's. It's actually number one in the Pokedex. Oh, it's the first. Po first Pokemon in the Pokedex. All right, there you have it. My first starter. So, can you give us a progress report on what's going on? Um, right now, I am struggling with coloring in this eye, <laughs> um, but I think we're we're getting close to being done here. I gotta get rid of this fake sunlight going on in here, and maybe, um, maybe give these guys just a little bit of texture here and there, and then I think we're we're gonna be close to done as soon as I color in this guy's toenails because he has toenails. Yeah, toenails. So it looks like you're doing some sort of layering. I am. I've got a whole bunch of layers going on in here that I haven't labeled. Bad me. Um, but yeah, just I use I use the layers to um, differentiate between shading layers. I can turn them on and off. Um, de different detail layers. You can make the line art layer appear and disappear as needed, which is usually never. Um, and then I'm going to use this last layer to kind of add a little bit of, like, shine and detail and maybe a little bit of hairs here and there to these guys. Okay. 
So we are getting close to the end. So if you guys have more questions either on Twitter um, or on YouTube, feel free to send those in and we'll try to get those answered really quickly. And if not, um, you can go ahead and again, we're going to be posting this on the blog in a couple of hours and you can hit up the comment section and ask any questions you didn't get to ask. Uh, we currently have two more in the queue for you, Natasha. Okay. Uh, is there a particular artist, famous or not, whose art you admire and love to look at? Tim Burton, of all people, Ooh. has been one of my favorite artists since I can remember. Um, I, he's got this really kind of unusual, sickly-looking style. It's really scratchy, and it's really pointy and sharp, and it's not anything that I like to reproduce. I was just going to say that seems completely opposite it, from your style. It is, but it's still so much fun to look at and just kind of like think about how did you come up with like these characters that are so unique and so cool looking. Okay, so it's more about like the worlds and the thought and yes, that. Okay. Yes, that's uh, the, the universe that an art is is drawn for is, is a really important factor for me. <laughs> okay. Um, so far, this is the last question, unless we get another one. Um, but what is the most layers you have had in one drawing? Ooh, I have never reached the limit. I'm not sure what the limit is, but I think the most layers I've ever used without merging. Oh, gosh. Um, like 150, maybe? Oh, my gosh. For, an, for a <laughs> Neopets piece, actually. Um, and one of my last Neopets drawings, I think, took, yeah, like 140-something layers. It was a lot. There were a lot of different levels of shading, and I w wasn't really sure what I was doing at the time, but but now I know I could have consolidated all of those layers and maybe wouldn't have had so many crashes that I had. <laughs> so it seems like that's something that you monitor fairly closely that is actually, in your pieces. I haven't, I haven't saved this whole time, so I'm just going to hit control. Uh-oh. Uh -oh. We're gonna we're gonna save this real quick, the old fashioned way. Save as. So yeah, we definitely want to keep stuff saved. Yeah. Okay, that's right. Yep. I had a I blinked for a second. I was like, what is this error message? It wasn't an error message. That comes up every time you save in Photoshop. Um, saving saving <laughs> is really important. Um, Photoshop is a lot more robust than it used to be. Um, doesn't crash quite as often. We do occasionally have crashes, depending on how many layers you use, so save often. Um, yeah. Any For other tips push. that you just want to share about art and Ooh. game art and software? And Keep drawing. Keep doing what you want to do. That, that's really all I got. If you like to do something, don't let anybody tell you to stop. I mean, they can tell you to stop all, all, all they want, but don't stop. Never stop. I think that's a common theme throughout the studio, too, is the idea of just making stuff. Mm -hmm. You know, if you want to be a game designer, make games. If you want to be an artist, create things. Yep. And um, it's a lot of the doing part that's going to help you get a job or, mm -hmm. you know, move forward. Because all, all the doing is going to, it's just going to build your portfolio if you're an artist. It's going to give you the experience that you otherwise wouldn't have had. Um, even if you're drawing Dakotas, that can help you. Even if you're drawing Dakotas, especially if you're drawing Dakotas. Which, again, if you haven't checked out that blog post, it's wonderful. And you really, again, we'll put a link to it in the blog, but make sure you check that out. That's got some great advice in it. Perfect. I think we're done here. Cool. Are there, and we'll give you guys just a minute more if you guys want to ask any other questions. Otherwise, Natasha, do you have any last words? Um, I mean, just for the, just for the live stream, not I just in general. <laughs> I wish I could have had a Lapras in Pokemon Go before it was my time. <laughs> um, I think I think that about covers it. Thanks for watching, everybody. Yes, thank you guys so much. Again, we are going to have this posted on our blog with some links and different resources from Natasha. Um, and thank you guys so much again for watching. All right. Thanks. Thanks, Kat. Thank you, Natasha. All right. We'll see you guys later. Bye-bye. <laughs>